Well, I'm going to preach out of the hymnal today. I've never heard that done before. Before you get real nervous, it's the first century hymnal, not the Baptist hymnal I'm going to preach out of. I want to preach on a hymn of the early church. I'm not sure if Paul wrote it or if Paul quotes it, but it is a hymn in the Greek text. It's very lyrical. It's very beautiful. So I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. The book of Philippians chapter 2. That special church in the life of Paul that he loved so very much. Now I realize that I'm breaking into a context by beginning at verse 6 and going through verse 11. I have two messages today that basically apply to everyone here. One is to those who are still in the process of meeting Jesus and one is to those who have already met him. And I really feel like I have a word from God for you, whoever you are. And I pray that the Lord's will might be done. This is one of the most marvelous Christological hymns anywhere in the word of God. Now there are some tremendous passages that deal with the person and work of Christ. There's of course John chapter one, verses one through 14. Beautiful account in Colossians 1, 13 through 16. Marvelous expression of Jesus in Hebrews 1, 2, and 3. But this is the only hymn, the only lyrical pattern that we have that tries to express our deepest understanding about the person of Jesus Christ. So I want you to follow with me as I begin in verse 6, and then at the end I'll come back and show you the context of verses 1 through 5 who, although he existed in the form of God. Now that little phrase, I think so often uh, we're kind of in a mindset today. I'm going to read the Bible through in one year. It really doesn't matter how often you read the Bible through if you don't understand what it's saying. And sometimes we rush into God's presence and into God's word and rush right out. There's a tremendous truth here in this little phrase. But it's kind of caught up in the original language. You have to compare English translations to kind of get at what it's talking about. We're talking about Jesus Christ who, though he existed in the form of God. Now, this could be a tense in Greek that meant continual action in past time, that Jesus existed. But it's not that. It's a present tense, which means habitual action, ongoing action, continual action, if you please. What this is saying is that he always existed. This basically is the doctrine of the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. There has never been a time when Jesus did not exist. Jesus was before Bethlehem. As a matter of fact, as surprising as it may seem, Jesus was before creation. In the New Testament, particularly Colossians 1 and Hebrews 1, also 1 Corinthians 8, 6, It says that Jesus was God's agent of creation. The one who spoke the worlds into existence. The one who flung the galaxies into space. The one that formed man out of the red clay of the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley. The one that breathed in the man's nostrils the breath of life was no one less than the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. This is so important that we see this. Yes, there was a kind of a new beginning at Bethlehem, but Jesus has always been with the Father. I guess one of the most uh, significant and to me meaningful expressions of this is in the Gospel of John chapter 8, beginning in about verse 56. Jesus has been dealing with the Jews, and the Jews come back to say, we're right with God because Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. They said, you're not even 50 years old. How can you say that Abraham saw your day and you knew Abraham? And Jesus made this startling statement to these Jewish people when he said, before Abraham was, I am. That may not sound uh, strange to you, But to a Jew, for him to call himself I am, that was the covenant name for God, Yahweh. From Exodus 3.14, that's the name that God gave to Moses when Moses asked, who shall I say sent me? And Moses, God says, I am that I am sent you. 
So what Jesus is doing, and the Jews knew it perfectly, was claiming not only to be God, but to be before Abraham. We know that because in verse 59, they try to kill him. My goodness. Jesus, born in a manger, is the very one that created everything that is. This word farm is a very interesting word. In, uh, the Greek word behind this is the word morphe. We get the English word morphology from it. Um, it is something of the outward form of something. We get the word metamorphosis from this. A worm becomes a butterfly. It means the essence of a butterfly is still a worm with wings. It's always a butterfly. It's always a worm. It's an inner form. Now, Jesus has always been in the form of God. When he was a baby, he was still God. When he was a young man, he was still God. He's always existed in the essence of God. I remember in my mind as I think what it must have been on that mountain when Peter, James, and John went up there and Elijah and Moses appeared and suddenly the, the deity burst out of the human form and they were all awed at the radiant presence of Jesus. He has always existed in the form of God. The next phrase is also interesting. Look at it, please. Did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, I don't know how much stronger Paul could say that. And there are going to be people who knock on your door and say, Jesus never claimed to be God. I hope you'll get your pencils out because I want to give you several statements from the mouth of Jesus as well as Paul that pretty much, I think, assert that Jesus, since age 12, recognized who he was. And I want to do it from the Gospel of John again. Let's turn quickly to John chapter 5, verse 18, and listen to the words of the apostle here. John 5, 18. For this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father and making himself equal with God. And also, while you're in John, turn over to chapter 10, verse 30. John 10, verse 30. Where Jesus says in this beautiful chapter about, I am the door of the sheepfold, I am the good shepherd. He says this, verse 30. I and the Father are one. That famous passage in John 14, right after the I am the way, the truth, and the life, in verse 6, Philip asked a question in verse 8. Show us the Father. And look at Jesus' response in verse 9. Shocking response. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know that to see me is to see the Father. Oh, what a statement. And then John 20, 28, for just one more. John 20, 28. Upper room experience. Thomas is finally there. And Thomas says to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus didn't say, oh, don't say that. He accepted that title. Now, I want to say to you, this is tremendously significant, I think, that Jesus accepts the title of deity. The affirmation that Jesus is God is not one the church has taken loosely through the centuries. It is surprising to me that the early church, a heresy developed, a heresy that said Jesus was God, but he wasn't really a man. In our day, it's exactly the opposite. Jesus Christ Superstar, God's Spell, the recent movie The Last Temptations of Christ have all tried to affirm that Jesus is really a man. But modern man is nervous about Jesus being fully God. And yet I think it's absolutely crucial that we understand this peasant carpenter really is God in human form. He really is the image of the invisible God. Why is that so important to us? Well, number one, Jesus made some astonishing statements about himself. I and the Father are one. Uh, I am the only way to the Father. You see me is to see the Father. Oh, my, how can someone say that? This old view that Jesus is a good man or a great teacher or a wonderful preacher or a religious genius, folks, that can't be true. He's either who he said he is, one with the Father, to see him is to see the Father, or the man is making it up, or he's deranged. Jesus is fully God. Look at the strong statement in Paul. Did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. In theology, we call this the Adam-Christ typology. 
In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. It may have been one tree, the two fruits, we're not sure. The tree of knowledge and the tree of good and evil, excuse me, of life. Adam was told of all the trees he may eat except of this tree in the midst of the garden. But Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. They grasped that which would make them like God. I think in time God would have given them of the fruit of both trees. But they took it and took it away from God because they wanted to be gods themselves. But Jesus is just the opposite. He was already deity. The pomp and glorious splendor of heaven belonged to him. But he was willing to lay it down. He did not grasp it. He laid it down. Why? Why would he do that? Because he was willing to leave the throne to be born into a stable. Why? So that you might have life. He who was rich became poor, that you might become rich through him. Oh, what manner of love is this? Why is it so significant that Jesus is God? I think for me personally, I have wondered about God. It has bothered me some of the things that God did in the Old Testament. I teach Old Testament. I know that he said in the holy wars, kill everything in the city. Men, women, children, if it breathes, it dies. Oh, my. Or Yuza tries to stop the ark from falling off the cart as David brings it back into Jerusalem. God takes his life. I must admit I've been afraid of God. Oh, my, if I make him mad, will he give me cancer or take my family or hurt my business? But when I finally came to realize that God's supreme revelation is not in a book because God is personal. God's supreme revelation is in a person. When I see Jesus, I know what God is like. When I see Jesus loving the children and, and bringing sinners to himself, embracing leopards, caring for the ostracized, suddenly it dawns on me one significant reason for it being important that Jesus is God is that I know God when I know Jesus and I'm not afraid anymore. The second truth is also here. It's in verse 7. But he emptied himself. This has been a hair pull in theology. It's called the kenosis passage. Did Jesus become less than God and became a man? I personally believe that Jesus being incarnate does not involve subtraction, but involves addition. That he wasn't less than God, he was just also man. I don't think he left his deity in heaven. He seems to read minds and speak to storms and all kinds of things. But what he left was the glory and splendor of heaven. So really he's God and man now. He emptied himself, being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. Now, why, why not just say he was a man? Well, he is like us in every way except that he has never sinned. He ha does not have the sin of Adam because of a virgin birth. He does not have the sin of yielding to temptation. He is the sinless one, the perfect one, tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. That's why he's like a man. Well, what's important that, that God is also in Christ as a man? Well, I think that's so important that he really knows us. He understands. I was trying in a Bible study to try to impress on people that Jesus was really a man. It's kind of hard to do because we lift him up so much. So I thought of this, tried to think of this wonderful way to do it. So I said, I know what I'll do. I'll use an example from common life. Je did Jesus have to brush his teeth? Yes. And then, oh my, a person raised their hand and said, how did Jesus brush his teeth? I'm in big trouble now, right? Because in the ancient world, the way they used for toothbrushes was pig bristles. Would a good Jew use pig bristles? <laughs> I ask you. <laughs> so now I don't know if Jesus brushed his teeth or not. But then the ultimate theological question came to me. Could Jesus have had a cavity? Now think about it for a minute. Some would say, no, he's God. Could God have a cavity? <laughs> but he was really a man. Oh, I think Jesus could have had a cavity. I'm sure his mother would have fussed at him about it, but I'm sure he could have had a cavity. He's really one of us. It's so hard for us to understand that. You mean all the things I do every day Jesus had to do? 
That's what I'm trying to say without being too crude. But I really want to get it over to you that Jesus is one of us. He knows us. What's important about that? It shows us what man can be. He, God incarnate was like us. He was one of us. Oh, amazing. It shows us what an example for us to follow. And by the way, Jesus' ministry is not over. The glorified Lord of heaven sits at God's right hand interceding for us because he knows us. Yes, he's fully God. Yes, he's fully man. And look what he did. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. Would you turn with me in your Old Testaments to Deuteronomy 21, 23? That's the book you haven't broke the silver thing on yet. <laughs> it's the one where the gold is still all there. Deuteronomy 21, 23, please. There's a little parenthesis in this verse, Deuteronomy 21, 23, that says, my translation, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now, originally, this referred back, of course, to the Old Testament setting of Moses' day. And then the most horrible thing you could do to a Jewish person was not kill them because they, they were killed in battle all the time. But the most horrible thing to a Jew was not to lose their physical life, but to be improperly buried, which they believed affect their afterlife. And so if you really wanted to shame somebody, really wanted to horrify somebody, really wanted to do the worst thing you could is to have somebody not buried. And the way that was done was after they were dead to publicly expose them by sticking them on a stake, letting the birds eat them or their flesh just fall off. Horrible to a Jew. Remember how the Philistines decapitated Saul and hung his body from the gate of the city? Oh, that was just horrible to a Jew. That's what this originally referred to. But by Jesus' day, the rabbis had interpreted this, Deuteronomy 21, 23, as referring to Roman crucifixion. Now, I want you to follow me for a minute. Most of my adult life, I've been told that the reason that the high priest and the Sanhedrin went to Pontius Pilate was because they did not have the right of capital punishment and they wanted Jesus killed, so they took Jesus to the Romans to have him killed. Well, that made sense to me until I started reading the rest of the Bible. And in Acts chapter 7, Stephen preaches his famous sermon in the temple. And the Greek-speaking Jews got so mad, they drugged Stephen out of the temple and stoned him on the spot, and they didn't say, kiss my foot to any Roman either. Why not just drag Jesus out of the temple and stone him to death? The Romans couldn't stop it that quick because they wanted Jesus crucified, not just stoned. This is the way I think it must have gone in their minds. Here is one who claims to be equal with God, claims to be one with God, claims to be God's Messiah. If we can get him crucified, will mean he's cursed by God and everybody will know that he can't be God's Messiah and be cursed by God too. That's why I think they took him to Rome, Roman justice. I think this is what bothered Paul about Jesus. How could the Messiah be cursed? But oh, friends... It finally dawned on Paul. So I hope it will dawn on you this morning. Galatians 3.13 says, He became the curse for us. What curse are we talking about? The Old Testament says, Do and live. But God help us, none of us have ever been able to do. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned unto his own way. None of us have sought after God. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Over our head of every human being was the curse of the Old Testament. If you know your Bible, Colossians chapter 2 says, He took that which was against us and nailed it to the cross. What was that? The Old Testament. And now we're under a brand new covenant. You see, Jesus actually took our place. He who was without sin did not die for his own sin. He perfectly fulfilled the Mosaic law of his day. So when he died, he could die for our sin. I really believe when we look at the, at the Gospel of Mark 14 and 15, we see that dark cloud coming about three hours into the crucifixion. I think that's really a symbol of God turning his face away from his son. Throughout his life, he had called God by the intimate term that a child calls his father at home. Abba, Daddy, Papa. But on the cross, he does not call God that. He calls God Eloi, Eloi, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? 
You see, I think what Jesus saw in the Garden of Gethsemane that terrified him so bad, and I, I hope you recognize that, that uh, the victory was really won in Gethsemane. He knew that he came to die. Mark 10, 45. I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. He knew he came to die. Why at this last minute would he want out of the deal? Because I think what Jesus had to go through on the cross, as the darkness is a symbol of God's turning his face away from his son, I think at that moment Jesus bore the sin of all the world, of every man and woman, of all ages, and Jesus experienced the last great experience of sinful man what it's like to be separated from God, what it's like to be lost. This separation, I think, is what terrified Jesus. If Jesus was terrified by what it means to be spiritually separate from God, we should take special note of that. Amen. Special note of that. I want to say to you that he was willing to go through Calvary that you might have life. Does it any wonder to you when people stand before God and say, oh, I don't think I need that. That's a real nice way. We're so thankful your Christians have told us this, but I'm a pretty good person. It's all going to work out in the end. Everybody's going to get there. There's no problem. My good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds. Can you imagine what the father who gave his only begotten son must think when men say to him, no, thank you, I'll do it my way? God took him, Corinthians 5, 21. God took him who knew no sin, made him to become sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Whosoever will call upon the Lord shall be saved. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful gospel. Here it's finished at Calvary as he dies in our place. Oh, if I had rhythm, I would be gone. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, given him a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven, of those on the earth, of those under the earth. Oh my, what are we talking about here? Friend, you do not have the choice if you'll confess Jesus. You only have the choice when you'll confess Jesus. You can confess him now and know the free forgiveness of sin. Know the peace that passes understanding. Know joy inexpressible. Have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Have a mansion prepared for you in heaven. Know he's coming back to receive you unto himself. Or you can wait until that great day where all of conscious creation stands before the Lord, both angelic and human. And that day, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What is the name that's been given to Jesus? It's the name Lord, which is the way of expressing the Old Testament covenant God, Lord. I want to tell you what. Christianity may not be true. If it's not true, you have nothing to worry about. God help me, what if it's true? It is an awesome thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Do you know him? I'm not asking you if, if you know about him. Do you know him? Do you, do you talk to him? Do you walk with him? Do you try to serve him? Oh, there's a message for you here if you've never trusted him by faith. There's a word here. I think it's a word of promise and a word of warning. Do you know him? We're all going to confess him one day. That's my message to you. If you're still in the process of coming to know Jesus, you're still searching for the peace you're looking for, oh, friend, I think it's here. I think it's in a crucified peasant carpenter who really was God in human form dying in your place. So whosoever will can be the promise and the call of the church. But I recognize that most of you here are probably already believers. So I want to come back now to verses 1 through 5 and show you the context that Paul uses this hymn. For this hymn is really not used in the Bible for evangelistic purposes. It's really not even used for theological purposes. It's used for motivational purposes. Let's read 1 through 5 together. I know your translation starts out if, but this is a first-class conditional sentence in Greek that's assumed to be true, so let me retranslate it. 
Since there is consolation in Christ, encouragement in Christ, since there is consolation of love, since there is fellowship of the Spirit, since there is affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the Spirit, intent on one purpose, doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, and we're off into the hymn. Now, what's the purpose of this? Paul says, as Jesus was willing with the full glory and honor of heaven to leave that to become a servant, he's calling on his people to leave their pride and privilege to leave their affluence, to leave their security, to leave their possessions. You say, you're telling us to get poor and just walk around? No, but I'm saying this. Most of you are trapped by the things you own. They really own you. Our day as a culture has become so secularized and so materialized that we kind of think that serving Jesus is coming and sitting in church two hours a week. I submit to you that what God wants for every Christian is not two hours a week, but 24 hours a day, seven days a week for his purposes, for his glory, and for his honor. And anything less than that is absolutely un-New Testament. He's calling on you to die to yourself and let his life flow through you to others. You say, Bob, can you back that up somewhere else? Now, if I can back it up somewhere else in clearer language, would you be willing to do it? Probably the problem is not that I can't back it up from the Bible. Probably the problem is we're too into our own selfish lifestyle to really care. 2 Corinthians 5, 13 and 14. Listen to the word of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, Therefore, all died. And he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Paul put it this way. You've been bought with a price. Glorify God with your bodies. Your life is not your own, Christian. You're here for a purpose. You're here as a witness. You're here as a servant. Life is not just how much fun I can have and how much I can accumulate. Life, real life, is knowing and serving God. Amen? God's will for every child is not wealth, health, prosperity. God's will for every child is Christ-likeness. And what Christ did is lay down his life for others.